This is Dr. Kim Allen Williams, Senior Chief of Division of Cardiology at Rush University in Chicago. You are listening to Interview with the Surgeon with the Surgeon Agent. On this episode of Interview with the Surgeon, we welcome Dr. Kim Williams, Chief of Cardiology at Rush University Medical Center. He has served as the President of the American Society of Nuclear Cardiology, Chairman of the Board of the Association of Black Cardiologists, and President of the American College of Cardiology. He has been the author or co-author of more than 30 original articles, more than 75 review articles, position statements, and editorials published in peer review journals, as well as more than a dozen textbook chapters. He has served on many committees and boards for the American Heart Association, American Medical Association, ASNC, ACC, and ABC. Right. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining Interview with the Surgeon. Today, we welcome Dr. Kim Williams, Chief Division of Cardiology at Rush University. Doc, how are we doing today? Good. How are you? Thanks for having me. Thanks for being with us. So let's just jump right into it. What were your goals and aspirations during your residency, and how did those change during your fellowships? So I went into residency uh, with two real loves. One was uh, heart disease and the other one was sickle cell anemia. So I kind of thought that I wanted to be a hematologist. Uh, I was actually doing my residency at Emory University at a time when the heart was the big deal. It was all the people who were involved with uh, high levels of education, involved with the American Heart Association. J. Willis Hurst, uh, the guy who really put together the, one of the best textbooks ever uh, back in the day and uh, all of his colleagues and those were my mentors. So it was sort of impossible not to go into cardiology if you were at all interested in it and you were at Emory University in the late 70s, early 80s. Uh, as it turns out, um, that really was the kind of thing that I was interested in because it, it seemed like I had done it before. That is, when I put a stethoscope on a person's chest and there was a murmur, it made sense to me in terms of the pathology. Reading EKGs just came naturally. Um, and so that actually is... You know, the, the mentoring advice that I give to everyone, you know, find out what you love and find out what you're good at. And, and if you can do those, those two things together, it's going to be great. I know that's part of the uh, big triad. The third one being if you can make money at it, <laughs> which I never was my goal. Um, so I would bring that down a, a notch and, and try to marry the things that you enjoy and the things that you're good at. So during your fellowships, can you kind of take us through your mentality going into your first job search and how that perspective changed in the beginning years of your career? So I started off in, uh, yeah, doing a cardiology fellowship back at University of Chicago, where I had been of uh, college and medical school, uh, you know, teaching tennis, teaching math. I was always at University of Chicago, other than the three years at Emory. Uh, and so when I started when, in cardiology, uh, I had had this major, really clinical um, training at Emory University, which was pure cardiology. And that actually uh, was, uh, an amazing opportunity for them to sort of uh, take an interest in me because I was so clinically oriented and experienced, <laughs> even though I was supposed to be the first year fellow. I kind of taught my attending how to take care of patients because I, he was actually more of an, a, a, a research person and I was more of the clinical person. Um, so obviously I wanted to marry the two um, and be academic and clinical. Um, and uh, the interesting part about it, uh, was the program at the time, and it's just how old I am, that we started to um, do nuclear cardiology. And I thought that's the furthest thing from my mind. I would never want to be around a bunch of isotopes and radioactive decay. And it turns out that I fell in love with it because it happened to be physics, which is my favorite subject, and physiology, which is my second favorite subject. And, um, and so I ended up doing three years of cardiology um, with the third year being research in nuclear cardiology doing rubidium 82 which ultimately is now approved and uh, is used around the world for, for positron uh, emission tomography. So the, the PET imaging uh, world, um, we were sort of the, one of the first area, uh, first uh, sets of people into that. And, uh, and after I had done the, that third year, uh, technically in the clinical pharmacology because I really was doing work for the FDA, um, it turns out that the nuclear medicine people, you know, cornered me and said, we really need you to do another year uh, because then you would be board eligible in nuclear medicine. And that would make you one of a handful of people in the world who's board certified in internal medicine, cardiology, and nuclear medicine. And it'll open doors for you everywhere. 
Uh, it turns out that was true. I did do the extra year. And, and, um, and at the end of it, um, or towards the end of it, the job search that, uh, you know, it was sort of a, a strange uh, environment. The high idea was I going to do private practice nuclear cardiology? Was I going to do uh, uh, academics? And I was interested in staying at the University of Chicago. I talked to my division chief, uh, Dr. Mort Arnstorf, who was a wonderful mentor. And I, and I talked to uh, the department chair and they both were on board and we were going to set up a joint operation with radiology and uh, my nuclear medicine uh, chief was all in favor of hiring me and uh, he set up an interview with the radiology chair who actually said the words i already have three nuclear medicine docs that i don't like why would i add a fourth so that was the only time I thought about going into private practice. Um, and I actually interviewed with a group in Atlanta that I had known from my Emory days. And uh, I was serious about taking a job there. And then uh, the Department of Medicine sort of overruled the Department of Radiology simply by going to the dean and saying, we will, we will hire him and we will pay all of this salary if, and he can just work down there. And of course, uh, they did that, and it turns out that the dean said, well, yeah, all the revenue goes from the Department of Medicine then. So the, that department chair in radiology was sort of, um, you know, he became a less favored person, let's say, and uh, he ended up uh, not being renewed. <laughs> so it was a bad decision. Nuclear cardiology became very large. It became one of the, the major sorts of revenue for nuclear medicine, uh, and one of, them, one of the major sources for cardiology. Um, so that sort of started my career, a rough, rocky start, but I, you know, started my own lab and, um, and made sure, you know, the cardiology folks didn't know the nuclear, the nuclear people didn't know the cardiology. So I was kind of like, um, the, I had to do a lot of self-mentoring, going to a lot of conferences, uh, reading, writing, doing research, and uh, ultimately um, became known as the guy who will straighten out the software and who will find the glitches in the computer programs and uh, write new ways of analyzing to make this test more accurate. And so uh, ultimately became uh, uh, very much involved in advocacy. Um, and it started off with something simple, like how many hours does a cardiologist have to train? It was like a thousand, okay, at the time, in order to, to be licensed in nuclear. It didn't apply to me because I had done a nuclear medicine residency. And so I just checked the box and I get my license. But for a cardiologist who wasn't going to spend those two years doing it, it was going to be very difficult. Well, if you were wanted to take an, a serious isotope like iodine-131, which kills tissue, and you wanted to be the endocrinologist giving it to, to thyroid cancer people, you needed training. And it was 80 hours. Now, wait a minute. 80 hours for something that's dangerous um, it could be life-saving, but still dangerous versus a thousand hours for something that's just a diagnostic test technique that so there was a discrepancy there so that was my first opportunity for advocacy going to regulatory bodies the nuclear regulatory commission getting the american medical association to help american college of cardiology and just trying to get people to make logic the interesting thing is that if you go to, to congress or you go to your medical societies and you present a cogent logical case you usually win the day and you get what, what you're looking for. So ultimately they did reduce the number of hours uh, substantially. It became a lot easier for a cardiologist to actually uh, become certified. Uh, and that made the, the technique grow tremendously. Um, so that was really uh, sort of my first foray. And then there were loads of things like, where are you gonna get the isotopes from? Why are we depend on Canada? Are we going to use, um, you know, highly enriched uranium, a lot of technical stuff that really needed to be made a lot more logical um, and sort of ended up in the middle of that and trying to make things better. Uh, so with all of that advocacy work, I ultimately was um, selected to be the president of the American Society of Nuclear Cardiology. Um, and once you're in society leadership, then people look at you differently. So the next thing you know, I was on the American Board of Internal Medicine writing the cardiology board questions. And they say, you know, I'm on the board of American College of Cardiology uh, and ended up in leadership there as well. So, um, you know, my advice to people that I'm training is to try to follow that path, be the best researcher that you can, get some research mentorship uh, and to develop your own interests. 
You've got to try really hard to become a master clinician, understand everything you can about clinical medicine and understand that it's always going to change. Then you've got to be able to teach. You've got to be able to communicate well enough with students and residents so that as a junior faculty member, you are respected as a teacher and people will call on you in, uh, for lectures and for opportunities to speak around the world, uh, which helps de develop your career and helps get your message across, whatever that is. And that sort of people were always talking about the, you know, the, the triple threat, okay? Of, but, I, but I would tell them that it's actually not just a triple threat, it's a five tool. Now, you know what that is as a, as a baseball guy. You know, it's uh, got a good glove, you can throw, uh, you can hit uh, for power, hit for average and has speed. Well, in cardiology, it's that triple threat of teaching, research and clinical master clinician but also advocacy, being able to go to and work with Medicare when they're telling you that they're running out of money and they're not gonna be able to take care of people. Who's gonna step up and try to change things around or help them design programs so that they are gonna remain solvent? Um, and the answer to that one, of course, is preventive cardiology because that's where they spend them a lot of money uh, on, press, on procedures that are necessary but shouldn't have been because we could have done something about it in the first place. And then the fifth tool is administration being able to understand how to read a spreadsheet, how to make a budget, uh, how to run your business. Even if you're an academic practice, it's still a business. Uh, and if you're not, don't look at it as a business, you end up not, not having a leadership spot. So what would you say were some of the keys to your success that shaped your early career as you climbed to the top of the industry? So I would say it really was the involvement. Um, talking about, uh, uh, doing the advocacy, working with the American Medical Association, which I started relatively early in my career. Uh, I actually worked for Medicare. Uh, it's sort of volunteering to um, be involved. So if I had to pick one word, it would be uh, concerned. <laughs> and, then, and then the second word would be to be involved. And if you can add insightful to that and helpful, uh, then those are the keys uh, to, to starting success. And that's probably true of any business. What advice do you have for the graduating residents and fellows as they enter the job market for the first time? So this is an interesting time. Um, the, the, the best advice I, can, I would always give people is to do what you love. There may be more limitations now than there were in the past based on the fact that um, there's COVID, it's hard to interview, it's difficult to uh, you know, fly around the country and look at a bunch of job positions. I can't imagine taking a, a position without seeing what the facilities are like, but uh, we are in, a, in that kind of era. And maybe, you know, everything will become three-dimensional and virtual and people will put on their VR glasses and be able to uh, essentially um, do the same thing that we've been doing for years. But right now it's a little strained um, and strange. But I would still give that same advice. That is, you've got to be going into something that you love. The work is hard uh, for a physician. The days are long. You have to be respectful of um, work-life balance. You've got to have the support of family. You can't blow off family just because your main priority is work. Um, you don't want to even admit that, particularly if you're in a relationship, that the main priority is work, uh, because it really shouldn't be. And, and yet, um, the work is so encompassing because you're saving people's lives directly or indirectly that all you can do is to, to remember to take care of your, yourself in terms of uh, having that support and having that balance. And in order to do that, you've got to be doing something you enjoy. I've seen so many people uh, who end up in a difficult spot. They don't enjoy what they do. They don't, they dread getting up and going to work in the morning. That's, that's not the, what a physician, should be in because if the stress is too high to add, um, you know, uh, the discomfort of being wherever you are, you have to love it. And so that's, you know, even if it meant taking less money or uh, being in a, in a place that you didn't expect to be, make sure that you're doing something that you really love. So one of the conversations that comes up a lot now is that everything's being done virtually, like you said. And with that respect, there are no national conferences. So what advice do you have for the graduating class that doesn't have the ability to meet you at a conference and they're really trying to figure out the whole outreach process right now? Well, it's interesting that as uh, you know, my last few years 
uh, particularly as president of the American College of Cardiology, I specifically had to, if I had to go from one meeting room to another, I specifically had to jog. <laughs> Just because of what you're saying, that is people would want to stop you and they'd want to talk to you, but that would make me late for, you know, sharing some session and the speakers waiting for me. Um, and so um, the, I think the, the opportunities to rub shoulders with people were probably less in the last few years uh, because the meetings were getting so big and they were so packed full of, of, of educational stuff. And so it really became less networking and more academic work. So I would say that not just now, but you know, for the past few years, people will reach out to you by email and uh, start a conversation when they're looking for a position. Uh, they've heard about your university, they've heard about your city, and people will start to uh, reach out that way. That actually is probably the best way to do it now uh, because you know, I, meeting someone, walking up to them cold, I guarantee you, if there's a leader, um, <laughs> they're busy, and you know, if you walk up to them at a meeting, they need to be somewhere else almost always. So, so I think the email is probably the best way to do this. Can you kind of talk about your involvement with the American College of Cardiology and how you're helping graduating residents and fellows? So, first of all, the American College of Cardiology is a 53,000 member, almost not American. You know, we have all of our international colleagues, uh, and we actually have 52 chapters, I believe, around the world now. And it's interesting that um, many of those chapters have wondered why do we, we don't call ourselves the International College of Cardiology. Uh, but, you know, we don't want to lose our, our roots. And uh, then there are other countries who are very proud to have American uh, <laughs> as, part of, uh, as part of their tagline uh, that they're a member of the ACC. Um, and so the purpose of the organization is to uh, really try to help uh, clinicians. The, the mission is to um, uh, improve heart health and transform cardiovascular care. And so people think that American College of Cardiology is the American College of Cardiologists. That's not true. We actually have nurses and pharmacists and um, physician assistants and uh, advanced practice nurses. Uh, we now actually have administrators, uh, cardiology administrators, uh, who help with the business aspect. And we try to put together programs that will help people in their practice directly, as well as, uh, as, well as the educational programs and, of course, the journals. So we do uh, specific leadership uh, training for young people. And we have an FIT, or Fellow in Training, um, group that actually uh, is very dynamic. They're very thoughtful and they're very engaged and they really are going to be the next leaders in the college. You know, if you fast forward a, a couple of decades, they'll, those are the ones uh, that are gonna be the presidents and, and the like. And we actually do focus on making sure that there's an early career section that we're talking about all the problems that people have uh, when they're going out into practice. And so that distinguishes us from uh, a lot of other member organizations um, that's, you know, purely dedicated to science or whatever. Um, we are actually interested in trying to make the whole practice uh, better. You know, I should say the, that we take this very seriously, um, most for, for two reasons. One is we have to, we, the college looks at itself, looks at itself as uh, an opportunity to be the agents of change. And that's why our mission is what it is. Um, and there, there are issues out there, um, uh, just a couple. I mean, the, the list could go on and on, but I would just say, uh, you know, in the United States, as opposed to our international partners, where there are issues with heart failure and healthcare delivery and, you know, smoking in, in young people and all kinds of things that we can try to help with. Uh, and sometimes we're learning from them uh, for things that could apply to our American population and state chapters of the American College of Cardiology. But I would say that our, our big issues uh, right now are, uh, and it's more of an American Medical Association thing than ACC, but we partner with them, is the fact that uh, the suicide rate in physicians, the burnout rate in physicians, uh, divorce, uh, all of the unhappiness that physicians face. And these are things that we have, to, we have to make the workplace better. We have to make the delivery of care better. And so that's really what we're dedicated to. The other major issue, which is very timely, you know, on, I, because of what's going on, not just with COVID, uh, but the other uh, major issue, uh, which is diversity and inclusion. 
uh, getting people to understand the importance of um, uh, equity, both male, female, and ethnicity. And uh, we are dedicated to that as well. And so they farm out some of the past precedents as uh, uh, task force folks and um, Dr. Pam Douglas uh, and myself and Dr. Minnow Walsh and, uh, and Clive Yancey. Uh, are some very prominent cardiologists working very specifically to try to improve diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, not just inside the college, but outside the college as well. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about how you switched from imaging to prevention? It's, it's interesting that my, my imaging experience actually led to, be, uh, to my interest in prevention. Um, that is, I was uh, in my lab about... It was 17 years ago, I remember almost the exact month where uh, I had a, uh, a scan, a nuclear stress test, person runs on the treadmill or we use one of the non-treadmill uh, drug agents. Uh, and it turns out that this lady had a pretty normal scan, it had one little tiny abnormality in the corner. But what we're supposed to do is compare with the previous study. And the previous study was horrifically abnormal. And I looked on my little worksheet, I'm used to seeing a, a, a significant improvement, but that usually comes at, uh, with bypass surgery or with uh, stenting of the arteries, if someone has multiple vessels. And it turns out that neither of those was marked. Okay, so first I challenged my staff. They're, they know that I demand all of this important information on my worksheets. And they said, no, she said she didn't have anything. So I didn't believe them, <laughs> I should have, because they're good people. I, so I called her on the phone and I said, you know, sorry to bother you, but I'm reading your scan. Uh, you know, you'll get the result from your doctor, but uh, it looks substantially different and, uh, and does actually look better. And I'm trying to find out how you improved uh, because they did not record the, the date of your stent or your bypass. And she said, I didn't have any said, well, what did you do? He said, I did the Dean Ornish vegan diet. And I was like stunned. And then I recalled having seen a couple of publications by Dean Ornish, um, some, and they were in big journals, and one of them was a nuclear study uh, done with PET. Uh, some of the colleagues had helped me with the rubidium back in the, in the early 80s. And so they had done these rubidium studies and shown that if you do a plant-based diet, ditch the you know, high, high fat, in, get rid of all the cholesterol, don't use the processed sugar, et cetera, a whole food plant-based diet, that your arteries would get better and the flow, the rubidium uptake in the heart would improve without having to have a procedure to open the arteries. And it can happen in as little as three months. Um, so uh, I, it, it turns out that uh, I had this in my head, uh, and I went off to the American College of Cardiology meeting of 2003, and I did my cholesterol like I normally would do. And just being a couple of years older than the last time I had done it, my cholesterol had gone way high. And so, you know, my diet was pretty good. The American Heart Association type diet, chicken, fish, no skin, not fried. And uh, I thought that I was in pretty good shape, uh, but it turns out that I was one of those people who genetically was going to have a bad outcome by eating any amount of cholesterol. So anyway, I looked more carefully at the Dean Ornish diet, and then right after that meeting, the portfolio diet from uh, University of Toronto was published. It was another, another style of vegan diet. It had more fiber and plant sterols and a bunch of almonds and that sort of thing, uh, but no cholesterol. And it turns out that I, I did that for six weeks and then retested it, and my cholesterol had gone down to normal. Um, so that convinced me that unlike uh, a lot of what we hear uh, back then, and you hear less of it now, but you still hear it on occasion, that diet does matter in terms of uh, your, your risk factors. Uh, and then the literature really expanded from there. So um, the reason that I'm so uh, vociferous about it now is that sure, we've been in a pandemic for 102 years. So the last time that heart disease was not the number one killer of Americans was, was 1918, when it, the Spanish flu took it out for one year. Spanish flu lasted three years, and everybody's talking about the, the second wave. There was a second, there was a third, there were multiple waves. Uh, it lasted until sort of the middle of 1920. However, in 1919, heart disease was back as number one. 
And so that pandemic, uh, and not just an epidemic, but it's a pandemic that's around the world. The, the United States develops antibiotics and uh, all of the infectious disease and communicable diseases get suppressed around the world. And then all of a sudden, heart disease is number one in all of the low and middle income countries and very few high, high income countries still have heart disease as number one, but the United States is one of them, okay? And so um, it turns out that the diet that we eat is responsible for the obesity epidemic that we have, the incidence of hypertension, high cholesterol, and, and type two diabetes. And guess what are the four things that make a person have a really bad outcome with COVID? Exactly those. And so if people would realize that when you're obese, you, you set up a culture medium, if you know, if you know what that means, uh, for uh, the virus. It loves to reproduce in fat cells. So the load of the virus in that person is gonna be higher. They're gonna spread the, the virus more because it's coming out of them more. And they're going to get a lot sicker. Uh, the hypertension is probably just existing blood vessel damage with a virus that attacks blood vessels. The diabetes probably has to do with the fact that the immune system doesn't work well in diabetics, or it's really the obesity that's, that's driving them. Uh, high cholesterol in the bloodstream, the virus loves a high cholesterol environment. It makes it easier for it to reproduce. So what we really need is everyone uh, for both the pandemics that we're living in, heart disease and COVID-19, is to change their diet and to do it now. Uh, drop the extra pounds, um, drop the inflammation that occurs. And that was, I mentioned David Jenkins, University of Toronto. That was the other major thing. Uh, I did measure my, uh, my C-reactive protein, that measure of inflammation. And it turns out it was kind of intermediate, uh, wasn't very high. It was in the lower intermediate range. After going vegan, it disappeared completely. And that's been shown over and over again. It doesn't, uh, you don't just lower cholesterol, you lower inflammation as well. So that's really what we need to be doing in order to uh, get the people, I'm not sure that we're going to stop it, maybe the, the, uh, from spreading, but we could certainly stop people from dying from it. Uh, we've got the medications that are improving, we've got and their knowledge of them. We've got the serum that seems to be working if, if the, the convalescent serum, uh, but how about not having people get sick? Uh, get the illness, but not get really sick. And to, to do that, uh, we need them to lose the weight and to fix the diet. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Interview with the Surgeon. Until next time, stay focused and keep following your dreams.